Thank you. Thank you all so much for being with us today. I'm going to go ahead and dive in. Uh, my name is Madeline Whittle. I'm a member of the programming team year round at Film at Lincoln Center and one of the co programmers, along with Devika Grish, of the uh, talk section of the 58th New York Film Festival, uh, which you are uh, joining us for this afternoon. We're really excited uh, about today's talk, The Making of Small Acts. We have a, a really incredible and dynamic group of people who are involved in making this film anthology, uh, which I hope that those of you who are joining us uh, live today have had an opportunity to explore uh, in NYFF. But before we get going, I will just say a few words of thanks and greeting and uh, then hand it off as quickly as I can. Um, the New York Film Festival has always been about bringing the community together to celebrate cinema. And uh, if you're joining us today in our sort of virtual world, uh, on behalf of everyone at Film at Lincoln Center, thank you so much for being part of what is truly a historic edition of the festival. Uh, between drive-in screenings and our virtual cinema, uh, it's been unlike any New York Film Festival of the past. Uh, thank you to the Film at Lincoln Center board, patrons, members, and all of the dedicated moviegoers who make our work possible throughout the year. As a nonprofit, we do rely on your support and becoming a member is a great way to join our community of film lovers. Uh, you can take advantage of discounts and special offers while helping us continue sharing the best in cinema with New Yorkers and beyond. And especially in this new virtual cinema realm, uh, we're excited to share the best in cinema with film lovers around the country. Uh, if you're not a member, consider becoming one today. You can find out all about that on our website, www.filmlink.org. Uh, we also want to recognize the tireless efforts of all the staff and volunteers who have been working behind the scenes to make this year's festival a reality. Uh, you can access the festival from anywhere in the world with our free virtual talk series, which you're about to uh, take part in today, which will continue to take place uh, throughout the remainder of the festival. They've been going strong for the last two weeks, and we've got another week of talks coming up. Uh, you can subscribe to the Film at Lincoln Center podcast for lots of good Q&As with filmmakers, panel discussions, and more good audio content. Uh, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter to make sure you don't miss any festival festival updates or announcements, and join the conversation on social media, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook with the hashtag NYFF if you uh, choose to share your festival experience. Last but definitely not least, a special thank you to our many festival partners, most notably today for uh, HBO, who's the presenting partner of Film at Lincoln Center Talks, and Campari, who's the presenting partner of the Small Acts screenings at NYFF. Uh, and finally, uh, thanks to all of you who are with us today on the panel and who are tuning in live for what's sure to be uh, a fascinating conversation. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the moderator of today's talk, who I'm happy to say is Dennis Lim, uh, Film at Lincoln Center's year-round director of programming and the programming director of New York Film Festival. Uh, so Dennis, take it away. Thank you, Maddie, um, and thank you everyone uh, for being here with us today. Um, it's, it's been a huge honor for us to have three films from the Small Axe Anthology in the festival's main slate this year, including, of course, our opening night film, Lover's Rock. We premiered Mangrove last week and just last night, Red, White and Blue. Uh, I'm going to introduce our extraordinary panel. First and foremost, of course, we have the director of the Small Axe film, Steve McQueen. Hello, Steve. Hello. Hi, how are you? We, like the Brady Bunch. <laughs> we also have two of Steve's uh, co-writers, Cortia Newland, who co-wrote Lover's Rock and Red, White, and Blue. Hi, Cortia. And Hi. Alistair Siddons, who co-wrote Mangrove, as well as the other two films that are part of Small Axe Education and Alex Weedle. Uh, the director of photography who shot all five of the Small Axe films is with us. Um, we weren't sure until a few minutes ago that you could join us, so we're very excited. Uh, Shabir Kirshner, welcome. Live all the way from Antigua. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now he could he could join us. Jeez. Don't worry about that. He was always going to be there. <laughs> To show us where he is. Kingston, Jamaica. And last but not least. Go on, turn your camera around. Make us all jealous. Go on. <laughs> I can't flex. I can't flex like that. It's a winter around the world, Steve. How are you going to do me like that? <laughs> all right. <laughs> And last but not least, uh, I'm delighted that we have with us two of the lead actors uh, from Mangrove. We have Sean Parks, who plays Frank Critchlow. 
Hey. And we have Letitia Wright, who plays Althea Jones. Uh, thank you to all of you for being with us. Um, I'll start with a question uh, for Steve, um, but anybody else can, can feel free to, to jump in. Um, maybe just start by setting up for us um, this fairly monumental project that is Small Axe. Um, a series <clears throat> that is also really um, a collection of, of standalone films uh, that it do speak in some way to, to one another. You've said that the impetus for Small X was to tell untold stories. Um, and obviously there, there are countless of these untold stories. Can you say a little bit about the process of finding and selecting these five stories, these five films, how you see them fitting together? Um. It was, a, it was a bit of a search. Um, I knew what I wanted to do at the first, but I didn't know how to do it. Um, there was a want, there was a need, um, and somehow I needed to do it um, because I didn't see it being done anywhere else. And in some ways I wanted to visualize something which was disappearing in a way. I wanted to sort of bring to the screen histories that had never been really acknowledged. That was so important for me because it was my life, you know, it was not my, you know, and, and, and a lot of people here, we, we, I'm showing this, this, this stream is lives, which wasn't, hadn't been documented, hadn't been dramatized, hadn't been sort of realized. So often you feel that you don't exist in a way, you know, you don't appreciate it. Um, so that was, the, that was my first sort of um, understanding of what I needed to, to do. Um, and then it was one of those slow, slow kind of um, processes um, of finding the stories. Because at first, uh, uh, this act started 11 years ago, um, when I was thinking about doing something about that one story over, over a period of time. That's when we, 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 I was thinking of that. Then we had the group, then they got a writer's room together. Um, and then when we had the writer's room together, there were, certain, there were certain stories which were definite before we, we, we actually started that writer's room, which was, which was the mangrove. Absolutely, the mangrove was, was one of them. Um, and as, as I can remember, when we, were, when we had this sort of writer's room, um, I remember I had to do something about a lover's rot, because it was my, my, aunt, my aunt's story. Um, and it was, it, anyway, I imagine Courtier and, and Alistair could tell you a little bit about, a little bit about how other things sort of uh, materialized at that point, but it was one of those things where it was about, I, I knew that I wanted to start in 1968 with Mangrove, because some for me, it wasn't about the wind rush. It was about when people were actually laying foundations down. What I mean by that is that at the same time as Frank Critchlow opens the Mangrove restaurant in 1968, there is a speech uh, by a gentleman called Enoch Powell. I'll tell you an interesting story about that Enoch Powell. I used to work at Marks and Spencer's. It's a, it's a shopping, it's a, it's a big suit supermarket in uh, uh, all over London, but there's one, the one over in England, there was one in, there was one in Kings Road. I remember getting on the train and opposite me, guess what, in 1988, there's Enoch, there's Mr. Enoch Powell sitting right opposite me. And he was disheveled. He was all disheveled and, you know, sitting on the side of, of, of this carriage. And there was this African lady just sat right, boom, next to him with her baby. And what was wonderful about that was, she didn't know who she was, he, he was, but the baby was crawling up her, her, her shoulder and reaching out for, for Enoch, reaching out for Mr. Powell. And he was like disheveled, and he was like, no. And the kid was trying to, to touch him, and the mother just pulled the baby down. And she didn't know who he was, but it was just wonderful to see. He lost, he lost, he lost, he lost, he lost. Mm -hmm. I wish to this day I had a camera. Anyway, I, that was a little diversion, but guess what? Interesting story, nevertheless. So please hand off to Alistair and Courtier. Oh, yeah, you go first, Bob. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, for me, it's, it, what's interesting is that, that these stories have been just laying there for such a long time, um, untouched and stuff. And I've always said one of the beauties of being a Black British writer is the amount of stories that we have to tell. You know, there's like hundreds of thousands of stories just out there that we can just pick up and hold and, and tell. And so many people are trying to tell them. So, um, it was just handpicking them, I suppose, once we were in the room. I don't know if you agree, Alistair. We just sat down and there were some stories that Steve came with and said, okay, well, I'm thinking about doing this. And we went down that ro road. And I think I can remember 
you know, us plotting out at least one story in its entirety that we didn't use in the end. And then we talked about another story uh, that logistically we felt we couldn't do justice uh, in the room as well. And we ended up like, you know, throwing that one out as well. Um, one story in particular, Alex Weasel came organically because Alex was in the room with us. And there was a lot of us talking about our lives and talking about our loves and talking about, you know, just uh, who we were as people. And that got brought into the room. And, you know, I did it, you did it, we all did it. But then when Alex told his story, everyone was mesmerized. So, you know, we want to hear more about that. And so it happened, you know, Alex came back and he brought in details of, uh, you know, what happened to him when he was in care, pictures of himself. You know, he was very reluctant. He was very, uh, very reluctant. Very reluctant. He was really yeah. reluctant. Yeah, he was really reluctant. But at the same time, it's, you know, that there was an interest, you know, there was a curiosity and we were listening. So well, he told beautiful. his story really reluctantly. Yeah, that was a beautiful I remember thing. Steve actually, it was really beautiful. Well, you say he's reluctant, but the day he, uh, we said, okay, we're going to do Alex's story. I walked out with him. And he was asking me, he was like, should I do this? And I said to him, are you kidding? Should you do this? You have to do this. You know, you've been telling this story fictionally throughout your whole life. You know, you know if you look at Alex Wheatley's novels, it's all talking about himself and what happened to him. But he's, ne he's never told his story. I knew it because I was friends with him. So, so um, and that's how it came about, through discussion, through discarding some stories, picking up other stories. And, you know, the thread was quite... Um, it was quite seamless for me, you know, like the connective tissue between, you know, each story was just quite, um, it was just there, it was quite obvious to me. I think it was interesting for me, the story was in the room. We didn't have to go that far. You know, we didn't have to go to outer space. We didn't have to go, the story was in the room. You know? Yeah. Alice, I don't yeah, know what yeah. you thought. I don't know. I can remember the day that Alex told his story in the room, I'll never forget it. You know, it was an extraordinary day that he, and we've been talking about all this different stuff and suddenly Alex tells his story and I, I can remember saying it's the best story I've heard all week, but um, no one's seen Alex Weasel yet or, or knows very much about it, the, the film. So um, in terms of Mangrove, you had a pretty clear idea, I think, Steve, at the beginning that we were going to tell this story and, and a large part of it was going to be in the courtroom as well. Um, that's kind of where I started anyway. Mm. And we had a lot of people come in and speak to us about various aspects of Mangrove and, um, you know, uh, various aspects of the court and the trial and stuff like that. And what it was like being in Labrador Grove, um, I mean, you know, in those years, 68, but, but even further. I mean, what was very interesting was that we, had, we, were, we were doing a lot of research and also with a lady called Helen Bart, who was you know, amazing as a researcher because we interviewed so many people. We interviewed hundreds of people um, um, and we're compiling something later on, hopefully we'll, we'll turn into a book because all these people were given an opportunity to talk and, and when they have never been even asked to talk. So there was this history of London, which sort of you know, emerged, which was incredible um, and hadn't been sort of heard before. And I think, again, those elements of, 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 of the um, research have found its way into uh, the um, the piece, and again, I think what happened with, with, with for me at least, what happened with the uh, writers' room, what actually happened was, in some ways, it was a bit of a, for more than a bit of what it was an audition, because we had other writers there. But for me, at a certain point, there was no need for it, and I wanted to sort of walk on, you know, sort of you know, focus with Courtier and focus with Alistair. I mean, that was that's what happened. Um, you know, it, was, it started off as one thing. Again, this is started off as so many different things, and now ended up as five feature films. And that was a sort of all, a, the, the, the organic nature of, of actually bringing this to the table. Yeah. Um, Steve, can you say a bit more about knowing that, you know, it sounds like you're describing Mangrove as, uh, Mangrove was always the starting point. Um, it's also the film, I think, that, you know, kicks off the series chronologically, uh, even though we opened the festival with Lover's Rock. Mangrove is also the one that kind of sets the stage um, in a way. It's this sort of panoramic film and it, I think what's really strong about the film is it really details, you know, the conditions that create protest, but it also, it's a film that is about the work of protest, um, which I think is, is why it's so powerful. But can you talk about why you, you, you wanted that to... You know, you know what's so interesting about that, Dennis, is that, you know, Roden Gordon was a very close friend of my father's, okay? They grew up together in Grenada 
uh, in a part of uh, the island called Paradise. Um, he used to come around our house all the time. Guess what? I didn't know that as a child. You know, as a West Indian child, you were sort of meant to be seen and not heard. There was a sort of, you know, very Victorian way of, of, of how children were meant to behave. And also, I didn't know about, you know, uh, the fact about the mangrove until, you know, maybe about 10 years ago, 11, 12, 11, 12, 12, 12 years ago. Because what happened, the, the hurt and the pain of that, it was so great. I don't think people talked about it. My, my father never talked to me about Rodan and this guy, you know, being involved in the mangrove mine. How is that possible? He grew up together. That was one of his closest friends. Um, so it, it's one of those things which, it's a history that I think a lot of people didn't want to, weren't, didn't know about for obvious reasons, and a lot of people didn't want to, want to unearth mm -hmm. because of the pain. And you could think about, you know, you could think about in, in the bottom of the and you could think about sort of, you know, you know, Black Panthers and Weathermen, all kinds of these movements and stuff, and what happens to them, and how they sort of try to sort of forget, and how the children, in some ways, are, are sort of caught up in the sort of, um, in the sort of, uh, how can I say, the, 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 the fallout, as it were. So it was, it was a difficult thing to start off with. And again, it was you know, Tracy Scofield was really kind of helpful in, us, in, in, in pushing that forward, as well as, of course, of Helen, of talking to people like, uh, uh, you know, Anthea and, 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 and uh, Anthea Lequant and, and, and Frank Richlow's um, uh, uh, children and, and, and his, and his, uh, and his, and his, and his, uh, uh, his, his wife. Um, so it's one of those things, and friends and associates. So it's one of these things which is kind of, it's kind of painstaking. I think, you know, Alistair, in, in his own research, uh, was, again, it was a lot of the detective work. It was, it was really well researched, but also, interestingly, it was extremely, um, it, was, it was sort of analytical, but at the same time, emotional, if you know what I mean. I think, you know, and that's where Alistair came in with his amazing research and, and whatnot. Yeah. I had actually been to Frank Fitzgerald's funeral because I'm friends with his children. So when I first met Steve and you said, oh, we're going to do one episode about Frank, I, I, I was kind of bowled away. I'd actually met his children a few, three weeks earlier to talk about directing a documentary that they, they, they were planning. So it was a story that was really personal to me in a funny kind of way, even though I'd never met Frank, I'd seen all this special footage of him, I'd watched everything that there, there was around whenever he was on tape and then it was just a case of piecing it all together as carefully and um, accurately as I could really you know I'd love to hear about this um, from the point of view of the actors uh, Sean and, and Letitia so your your familiarity with these stories and also your process of, of researching did you know about the mangrove nine um, I, I know Frank Critchlow is, isn't is no longer alive but Althea Jones is I believe yeah Oh yes, yeah, she is. She's still alive. Yeah. yeah. Um, and did you you talk a little bit about re researching and also um, how much you knew about this this the story of the mangrove nine? Um, for me personally, um, I didn't know anything. I how I even came became attached to this project. I saw about maybe about two thousand and fifteen. I saw there was an advertisement like an IMDb broadcasting of, of uh, Steve McQueen uh, doing something with BBC in terms of the West Indian community. And I'm from Guyana, we've adapted uh, the, the, the culture of, of the West Indies, um, even though we're located in South America. But immediately I wanted to be involved and I kind of did a little bit of a research thing with my agent saying what is this i've never we've never <laughs> i've never auditioned to play <laughs> someone from the caribbean before or represent our culture in that way whatever it is i, I want to know about it and then um slowly but surely um the news about it and the story became a little bit more clearer and then i was given the script whilst i was in trinidad and tobago on holiday actually and I saw Althea Jones and I saw the documentary about the Mango of Nine and, and it really it really stood out to me how how little information I knew as a young black person in this country. And it and I remember when I first met Steve and I asked him the question, like I would ask any director, you know, why do you want to do this? And he made it very clear that our ancestors are passing away. You know, they are that time frame of their stories being told is passing away. 
and it's very important that we tell it and from that moment on I remember just you know I could see the the <laughs> the, the variety of different people in my families my aunties um who are from Guyana um my cousins who are from Trinidad um all over the world in the UK and the US and the fact that their stories were so untold and what really stood out to me is how little I knew about um, our history as black people here in this country. I felt a little bit, a little bit ashamed, actually. Um, I was, as soon as I got into school, the school educational system, I was taught about everything from the Tudors to the Victorians to, <laughs> to everything that was not my people. And then how, and how we were, and, and how we still are predominantly um, uh, so effective and so important in the, in the building of this country. So that for me was amazing to unravel and discover and research. And then of course, meeting Althea jones Lecomte was scary, but amazing. Um, <laughs> so it was just like, I didn't want to mess up, you know, her story and what she, what she, what she was about and what she stood for. But I made the promise to her that I'm not trying to play her or be her. I'm just trying to represent her. And um, it's this, this story in this world and this, this project has blessed me far beyond um, my imagination. And I'm so blessed with the education I've learned um, and that I continue to, to learn about so I can teach my own kids about it. Yeah, I'd just like to echo everything that Steve um, and Letitia has said. Hello, Letitia. Um, hey. Because, the, yo, all right. So, uh, because, um, again, being a, being a Londoner, as well. Um, I'm always looking out for real stories. It's, it's kind of like my chosen subject, the idea that says that uh, as an actor, I can represent someone who actually lived um, and it's a great story. You might want to sit down and listen to this. And I come from that, that place of really trying to tell a story. And, um, and I've discovered when I've, uh, for myself specifically as an individual, that when I've done stories as an actor, that do represent my, my mother's, my father's, my grandparents' um, lives, if you like. I've got something out of that that I might not get uh, doing other roles. Uh, I don't know if you can understand what I mean, but I've discovered that I really get something out of it by, as Letitia says, representing um, someone who's actually lived. People haven't pulled this out of their backside this story. This isn't one of those things where you're like, well, I, I don't think that he should have done that. It's like, no, 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 he did do that. That, that did yeah. happen. So, um, and, um, and the world, or should I say our world was affected by that. And, um, and I find as a result of um, playing these roles, there's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's cathartic. It, it's, there's something that gets massaged in my brain and in my soul. Um, when we're representing, uh, you know, stories that we recognize. Um, so again, everything that Steve has said and Letitia has said, that's just an exclamation mark on the end as to why it's so important for me uh, that uh, a role like this has even been written, uh, show, a show like this has even, because again, for Americans, my thing is, is that um, I don't know how much you know about Britain in America, really, uh, like the real Britain. I'm really not sure. Um, I mention things when I'm in America and it's not America's fault, but the point is I mention things and they look into the middle distance like, ah, oh, huh, yeah, I don't know that. Well, we know so much about you guys. I mean, we know so much. Why is that? Because you put it out there. Yeah. So, um, and we love the fact that you put it out there. This is not me having a pop. We love it because we drink it up, we drink it up. But um, I've noticed that there's not too much for you guys to latch on to when it comes to um, our history. So again, hopefully this can bring people together. It can make people understand actually how similar we are, because we all understand the differences. Um, and, and maybe from there, who knows? Who knows? Uh, maybe this could be a new dawn. I wanted to come back to, um, I think what's, what Steve um, Cortia and Alistair was saying about just the overall 
just the overall shape of, of, of the small axe project um, and maybe um, bring Shabir into this discussion too. Just looking at the, the three films that, that we've seen, that we've shown in, in the festival, um, you know, I'm struck by some common themes. Um, this theme of self-sufficiency seems to recur throughout the films. The idea of you know, people taking matters into their own hands or creating spaces that otherwise would not exist. But there are also really striking differences. I, mean, I, I love that all three films are so different in their narrative focus and in their tone and in their look and in their feel. And, um, you know, that, that seems to be, um, uh, yeah, I wonder if the, if, if the three of you and Shabir can talk a little bit about that, about creating distinct films that still speak to one another. Shabir, I don't know if you want to start with the images and, you know, um, I, I, yeah. I know, start with Mangrove and then see what, where, where we go. Yeah, I mean, um, it was like, I think it's like very early on, we just, you know, Steve is very clear that the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth is what matters. And the truth is on the page, you know, and it was it was within the scripts and it was within the stories. And so I think, you know, it was just trying to find like what, like each film's identity is. We approached them all, like Steve said very early on, like this isn't like, forget about TV, these are films, like treat them like films. And so we approached each one like a film. And so yeah, the BBC finding... didn't know that though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was so funny because he like, like very Suckers. early on, like Sorry. And Steve like came up. <laughs> Steve Every came up day. He's like, he's like uh, actually, you know what? Like, don't tell anybody. Um, and, like, <laughs> we're making these into, we're making these into feature films. And I was like, and I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, yeah, like only you and the script supervisor and like one of the producers know, like keep it between us. And you know, and it was like, oh shit, okay, we're going all in on this. Um, and so that's kind of like how, like we just approached it. Like, you know, we would, we would any, any film, any feature film and, you know, um, and we just went from there and, and each story had its own identity and that identity revealed itself um, as we got closer to making it. And, you know, Steve and, Steve and I, we spoke, we spoke, uh, we spoke a lot about each film before one, but never, we didn't really, didn't really like think too much into the future. It was very much about like what, what the task at hand was. So Mangrove was, and then Lover's Rock was, and um, like Lover's Rock was like the day we, we met up to like talk about Lover's Rock for the first time was the day after Notting Hill Carnival, you know? And I had gone to Notting Hill Carnival and I had just like, it was just one of the most amazing experiences. It was like 2 million people you know what I mean? And it was just like life yeah, everywhere. And like, I was like, yeah, yeah I was like, you know, like, it was like, just like people like <laughs> dancing and grinding up on each other. And it was like all West Indian flags. And I was like wrapped in an Antiguan flag. And, you know, the next day I'm like, I have to go and meet Steve at like 11 a.m. I'm like, oh, fuck. I'm like, you're a mash. Over. And they, you're I like mash walked up. in and Steve like looked at me and he's like, you were mash up you're yesterday. Mash up. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was, but like, like check it, like all of that energy, like everything I had experienced, like I, like I brought, like all of that came to the table when it, when we started talking about Lover's Rock and how to go about executing that. And um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers anything. But. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I mean, with, with Van Grove, it was one of those things where, um, you know, I think it's one of those things where, you know, talking to Alistair and, and stuff and for me it was just interesting because it was just so humble the beginning of the picture and i think you know alistair came up with this line the clr james the clr james uh, um uh, quote um i don't know if you could re revive it it's just a, a beautiful quote that, that an, an everyday man could be a lead, leader without even without even knowing yeah i was at the time i at the time i think i was perhaps a little bit um, uh, nervous about trying to write CLR James. So I was reading everything. I, I just read everything I could find. I listened to him for hours and hours and hours. There's amazing, there's amazing um, clips on YouTube of him talking, which I'd sent to Steve in the middle of the night, then you've got to listen to this. And then I found that quote by accident, just going through a book, I think it was Facing Reality, where he talks about how to build a new society, how to make that change. And it was just one line in, a, in an otherwise fairly irrelevant article um, about how these are new men, these are the new leaders. And um, I remember texting it to you and, uh, you know, getting a good response. But, um, yeah. 
it was beautiful. And I beautiful. think, you know, just him walking, going from this sort of gambling den, walking through the, um, the, the, you know, the post-war Britain, you know, with this sort of, you know, uh, the whole idea of modernity, the whole idea of this, the West way, you know, even the West way sounds like the space age sort of, you know, knocking down, uh, you know, um, houses, knocking down social housing, just to sort of make sure that people get to where they want on time in the super highway. It was very relevant to show that at the beginning of, of, of the picture. And at the same time, so in, in a way, the movie for me was, there's a humbleness about it. It was, it was almost like a, a soap, a little in a humble soap, which sort of galvanized to sort of this sort of, you know, epic, as it were. So it starts from this sort of disheveled situation where this guy is just trying to make a, you know, a hole in the wall cafe to the highest court in the land. That, that was, the, that was the, the, the trajectory. And I think myself and Chavez spoke about that and how, mm. far from, I mean, there's a one half and there's a second half, but I don't even speak about that, Chavez. Sure, yeah, I mean, we I mean, we spoke a little bit about it, like you know what I mean, like um, it feeling a bit like a western, you know, like one man mm -hmm. like defending, like like defending his post, like defending his his bar, his saloon, and um, and it's very much like it was a very much a film, you know, because we did it in two parts. We did like you know there was mangrove, then there was a trial, and it very quickly became one one thing. And and I think um, you know the like one of the big sort of Overarching visual themes was like this is how do we like fit the community into one frame as many as much as possible you know like this is but the funny thing is we shot the court first we shot the court yeah yeah, yeah it's true yeah so we should we shot the courtroom stuff first and it was like yeah just like trying to trying to like like to show this this collective community is like a a force a unity within one frame and and you know so that was something we spoke spoke quite a bit about. I'm just going to ask one more before I start taking audience questions because we have quite a lot of people in attendance and the questions are coming in. Um, so quick. <laughs> uh, so the, these are all all period films, and I, I think you can you can think of period films as sort of always in conversation between two periods, the periods that they're depicting and the periods in which they're made. Um, and I'm wondering how much that was part of your discussions. To what extent did you want these films to speak? to the present. Um, you know, obviously they're emerging into a very particular context in terms of protest uh, and conversations about systemic racism, police brutality, all themes that are, you know, very much present in the films. Um, well, gee, I didn't make sure to take that one. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't mind. Um, yeah, I, I just, I didn't really bother myself with that. As a writer, I never tried to think, okay, I'm going to make this relevant to today. I knew if I was really, really specific about what happened in the 80s, if I was really specific about what happened in those blues parties, it would just come out, you know? So I immersed myself in the detail, the period detail. And I have to say, for me, it was like really amazing because I felt for the first time, all of those things that I felt was really important as a black British person, someone who I really loved the culture, <laughs> I really loved my culture, it was the first time that it was relevant to somebody else. So Steve was saying, ring that stuff, give me that stuff. And I was like, okay, well, here we go. And I remember having a conversation about, you know, Lovers Rock initially when we were talking about doing the scripts and I was saying to Tracy actually, to tell you, you know, it's going to be really, really black. You understand it's going to be really, really black. I'm going to do it in a really, really black way. How, how could it be anything else? Be prepared. How could it be anything yeah, else? Yeah, be that, is, that is well, also, yeah. Of black British yeah. art, right? And, and, and oh, yeah. really, like black art in general, right? There are many different ways to be black, you know. And I think um, it, it speaks of our marginalization that we, we very rarely get the chance to actually express ourselves. So there's always this trepidation, you know, it's like it's where the code switching comes from. Can we actually be ourselves? I think that's part of what the films are really about as well, in a sense, you know, like Mangrove, uh, you know, Lovers Rock is like, how do we manage to manifest our true selves? in a place where we are not the host, you know? I think that's really like, like important. Well, think, um, you know, oh, like Frank's trying, to, Frank's, tr Frank's trying to build this restaurant and stuff, and he's trying to serve the Caribbean community, and these ag antagonistic forces come from outside and trying to stop him doing that, you know? Uh, in Lover's Rock, uh, it's people trying to find an oasis from the antagonistic forces outside and creating their own space where they can truly be themselves, you know? So, yeah, yeah, it, it's just, I, I just, I really felt that. And for me, as a writer, 
although I'm steeped in that, and while I, I really believe passionately in that, it's not always received in the best way when you're putting these things together. You don't necessarily get all the accolades and all the stuff that, you know, yeah, well, you've never been given the opportunity I don't care about those things. Yeah, I think, I think the situation yeah, yeah. is that's exactly, yeah. that's exactly what you're saying is that the opportunity, because the fact of the matter yeah, is, is, exactly. is that, you know, you being you and whoever as an artist, especially in the UK, you know, yeah, it's like who you are, what you do, you, you, you know, but the fact of the matter is, yeah. is, is, the, is the, the platform has not been given uh, to you in that right, way. That's right. uh, and, that's, that, and that's it. But the fact that you, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you could not be anything other than who you are. And I think that, that's the beauty of, 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 of what you can be yourself. Yeah. For sure. Fuck yeah. Who else can we be? Yeah, and yeah. also, that's the situation. We had a conversation today, Courtia. Courtia, can you. So we had a conversation today about uh, Red, White, and Blue that was fascinating. Mm. I don't know, you remember to pick that up. That was interesting because it yeah, kind of leads to what you're it. saying. Within that environment, can you be can you be black? Within yeah, that yeah. Environment, of course you can, but you have no way to go. But, can you be black? Yeah. But Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, there's acceptable sorry. black. There's black that people understand and they are familiar with. And then there's there's uh what quote unquote unorthodox black, you know, there's the black where you're you know, you're just trying to be a human being. Mm -hmm. You don't, uh, you know, Teju Cole said this at one point in time, and, and, you know, I've said it for years as well. You don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm black. And it's the first thing you think about when you get up. You get up as a human being, and you just, you just be, you know. But uh, I think, out, you know, outside of that, you're always having this, um, these assumptions put upon you about ways of behaving, ways of being. You must fit in, you know. Pulley's always saying, you know, we've got to nudge them back in line, you know, if they get out of line and stuff. And so I think it's um, really difficult for us as part of our culture to just express ourselves and be. And I think that, that all of these, these characters manage to find a way of doing that, whether that's accepted by the, 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 the culture or not. That's great. Um, I'm gonna start with a question from uh, Vijay Rajkumar, who wants to know if the filmmakers could Talk about how they would situate small acts in relation to other films that have depicted the West Indian community in the UK. Um, for example, Hands Worth Songs by the Black Audio Film Collective or Franco Rosso's Babylon. Um, and if any of these films were, were influences. In the so little films yeah. uh, about the West Indian community that, you know, obviously we, 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 we obviously looked at them and whatnot, but that wasn't... Uh, um, you know, there's so many stories that that was you know, the fact that they, they exist made us happy, but there were so many different things to do. So uh, I hope that answers that question. Okay. Um, there are many questions about music, um, all kinds of questions about music. Maybe you can just start by speaking, uh, Steve, just more. Music plays an important role, in, 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 I think, in all the films. Um, you know, not just as a soundtrack, but in terms of how they're integrated into into scenes and very much part mm. of the characters' lives. Mm. Oh, um, well, um, I was waiting for the question. Um, okay, um, yeah, um, it's it's. And I think we, we are music. Talk about being black or blackness, or that is, you know, I imagine the ultimate way of 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 of, of expression because. You know, it's about the whole idea of freedom, the whole idea of, you know, um, spirituality. Everything is involved in that. And I think that, you know, it's one of those things where you go, you know, back from, you know, from church and, uh, you know, and, and, and a sense of religion and, and X, Y, Z. So it's, it's a part of, of, of the narrative of black people in a, in a, in a real way. You know, it's, 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 it's the, it's the, uh, it's, it's the sort of it's the, it's, it's the earth and it's, it's the blood. It's, it's it is what it is what it is. So that was integral uh, to us, and it was integral to us. For example, obviously in the in Love Is Rock, um, uh, in the way of, of how we you know again how we sort of plan that. You know, I think all, I, I told you if I can remember correctly, it was it was in, that was somehow the, that was that was the narrative in a way because it was. I remember you said to become through fighting. I was like. Oh yeah, I remember coming through fighting, but I had no idea that was one of the things that were in this like the, the blues because I remember as a child. But I was at that age when people were dancing to that stuff. I was I was I was about this high, you know. 
Uh, but I knew about the, the you know, the, um, um, you know, uh, excuse me, uh, um, the chic and whatnot. But that was beautiful. But that we the the the, the, the how the DJ how, how the sound man how, how, how the selector built his narrative is how we built uh, uh, his selector records is how we built our narrative. The, you know, the dub was the most important thing. I don't know if you add to that, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was, it was, I mean, I remember uh, being in the room and, and Alex, Alex brought up the Kung Fu Fight and obviously I knew yeah. this song, but it was Alex who talked about that being in the dance and then I went back and I said to my mum, I was like, mum, did they really like drop the Kung Fu Fight in right in the middle of the dance? And my mum was like, yeah, they did. Like, well, that, mm. I didn't remember that bit. But um, for me, like the thing, the key point for me that was really, that I remembered and stayed in my memory was the night ending in dub. That for me, because that was always my mm. favourite part of the night. That was always when it would just get really like, just mm. like, I don't know, just uh, abstract and, and minimal and all this stuff. And that's, I love the music and stuff. I love the way that people moved. I love the way that the red light looked and the shadows and all of that. And so, yeah, that for me was the point that I was building to in the scripts, you know. I couldn't wait for that part. And yeah, the narrative of the DJ was, was key in that, you know, the songs that you played to get to that, that point yeah. of reckoning and freedom. Yeah. I think also that tune, Kunta Kinte, when I heard that tune, I thought that has to be the tune. Yeah. Because it was like a dog Beautiful. whistle going off. I thought, oh, yeah, that yeah. is the tune. Because yeah. we were looking for the tune, looking for the yeah. tune, looking for the tune. I couldn't find the tune. And then when I heard that tune, my needle drop. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, what the hell? I had to just yeah. <laughs> jump. I had to just jump up. Anyway. Ring the alarm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love how Steve switches to, to, his, to his Caribbean accent. Just jump up. <laughs> jump up. I, I love it. This must be my, this must be my dad in me. Goodness gracious. I love <laughs> it. My voice goes like three octaves high for some reason at certain point. I'm moving on. No control. Next. <laughs> there are a lot of questions for... Um, Shabir's. Um, <laughs> some of them are more technical. They want to ask you about things like making decisions about lighting and lens choices. <laughs> um, if you want to get into that, or we can Trying also to get talk. a secret. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think uh, some some people have also noted um, uh, your way with uh, crowd scenes, which I think are very striking in both Mangrove and Love Us Rock. Um, obviously, very different types of crowd scenes, but I think just uh, you know, the, the way the camera actually participates in those scenes is, is really striking. I'm, I'm gonna see one, I just want to start. Shebe is one of the best hands I've ever seen. He's a skater and a sailor, and that's his, his sense of balance is ridiculous. That's what I want to say. In that blues, in the right scene, it's just because his sense, his sense of, of, of gravity, center point of gravity is unbelievable. That's what I'll say. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, technically, I don't know. That's like a, such a difficult question to answer because it's so dependent and it's quite, you know, some, some of it's quite intuitive. A lot like some of the handheld work, like in Lover's Rock, man. Like, I don't know. Like, it's very hard to explain looking back on it. Like, Lover's Rock. You were like, in the dance. You like were, we were in the dance. We were in the oh, dance you, and like something spiritual happened. And like, it was mm -hmm. like jazz, you know? It was like, I just kind of like, we just, you know, Steve was like kind of, I had a headset on, Steve was in my own. The rest of it was just like dancing. And I, I, it's, up to this day, I still try and, and think back on it. When it when it's, very, it's a very difficult thing to, um, yeah, it was just, it was spiritual, you know? It was, it was something, it was, yeah, it was spiritual. It just like came, whatever happened, just, just happened, you know? Um, and the choices were very sort of like, very instinctual as well i mean as far as like the camera movement goes and the way that mm. we sort of participated like i think like that last like Kunta kinte track like we pulled that up like four times like back to back and um mm. it was like the third time like was like you know like everybody was just like you know like possessed by the music and possessed by each other and and by the last track, like I don't even remember like shooting the last take of that because it was like you know it would it would like finish and then Steve would be like pull up like come again like you know get back and it would just like everybody would just pack would just start over and we would just start filming again, you know and, rewind um, that rewind yeah re like rewind, rewind it like pull it up, <laughs> um, yeah so um, yeah I don't, it's 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 quite that was quite. 
that, that was a, that was just like a, a quite a special moment to try and um, yeah, it's very hard for me to explain. The the riot sequence, um, you know, the protest sequence, the in 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 Mangrove, man, I just you know, I just we just like Steve and I just like we had like we had chat talked about we had this one shot like set up on a crane, right? And then like we just quickly figured out that like that wasn't that was not like how we wanted to to express the sequence. And so I mean, the rest of it was just again just like just decided that like for this scene, for this moment, the here and now, the camera needed to feel alive. It needed to feel attached to the mangrove, you know? Um, and and that's what we did, we just kind of kind of went in. It was raining that day as well, you know? Um, and it was just, again, it was one of those things that everything was just happening quite quickly. And um, just like intuitively decided that this was the best way to go about doing it, you know? But it wasn't, yeah. Um, I don't know if that's like I don't I've never really like answered questions like this before so I don't know if there if that's like enough information or not but um, yeah. Uh, Sean and Letitia, do you want to uh, say a bit about your experience shooting those those scenes in Mangrove? Letitia? Um, Talk about the bit yeah. when you were in the courtroom um, you know the bit when Frank wants to possibly um, uh, forgive me for being bold, and, and uh, when he wants to possibly, you know, uh, sort of uh, say he's guilty, please. That's yeah. amazing. Mm. Yeah, for, for us really, um, what we really appreciated was, we knew we were shooting on film, and for me that was my first time shooting on film, and and I could I could sense just the importance of just, it's not about having 5,000 takes, it's about coming with the reality in your spirit, like that truth in your spirit and just being ready. And I loved what, I loved how I saw Xavier and Steve work. It was like, chem it was like music, just the chemistry between them. And I picked up on that very quickly. Um, and they didn't make it technical. It wasn't this stand on your mark here. You have to take five steps there. It was have your character, know who you are, tell the truth and we will work around you. We will, we will pick it up. So in, I remember there was a scene, a very prominent scene that really, you know, everything is truth that we do here. So it actually happened. Um, and Sean's character was in a, in a, a, a place of jeopardy of what to do and, and, this, and the decision to make. And I remember just preparing for this at home and coming in and, and Steve is very particular about making sure that our emotions are not wasted every take. It's like, everybody needs to be ready because we need to grab this. This is, this, this needs to be special. And I remember he would be very um, sensitive to how I was feeling and okay, cool. Do you want it? Are you ready? Cool. Good. Everybody set. Let's go. And I remember doing that take and I forgot the camera was there. I forgot the boom guy. I forgot everything. I just remember just having a mission and having something to say and something that I, I prayed would echo to, to our audience members and, and, and would be prominent, not only for us in the room, but for everybody that watches it. And they got it in like two, three takes, I think, and, and it was over. And when I watched it back um, la uh, earlier this week, you know, the, the, the work that Xavier did to, to capture every moment, to capture the shoes flying, <laughs> to capture everybody's reactions in that moment was beautiful. And the same with the riot scenes too, the, the, the same with, I don't want to call it a riot, but a protest. Um, our protest scenes, we just, we were just our characters and they just worked around us. It, it was never the headache of the technicalities of, of, of that filmmaking comes with. And, and we respect the technical aspects of it, of course, and we want to be artists in that sense. But the freedom that they gave us to just be, and they worked tirelessly to capture every moment was was in a sense freedom for us. Um, so thank yeah, you, <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, like, like I, I don't, you know, I don't know if you you know, but like that scene between you and Sean in having that discussion um, in in the in the basement of, of of the court, like Steve, like didn't like Steve was very clear. He was like didn't let me see a rehearsal at all. He was like, no, mate, like. No. Like just be ready. Like light wherever you you think you need to light. And I'm like, I have no idea. It's like on, it's, I have no idea where people are gonna land. You know what I mean? And uh, it was just like, Focus, it was just like very, 
Yeah, like, it was yeah. just very like Steve, like you really sort of like encouraged us to trust. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that that like for me, like I went home, like I it, that scene just happened, and I don't again. It was one of those things that just unfolded. Um, and I went home. I, did, I don't think I slept for a couple of days after that, just because I was like, what, like, you know, like, what, what are the rushes going to come out? Like, what, you know, and so just processing that whole, um, yeah. you know, style of filmmaking. And, and I think, you know, from that moment on, it was like, okay, like, this is, you know, like, this is how, this is how we're doing this, you know? And it was like, yeah. it was it's just like something that was has, quite magical. Yeah. It's just that everyone has to be ready, you know? Yeah. You lived your whole life to be here with that camera, mm -hmm. with this. Situation. It's like again, it's like a you know a Olympic athlete. Your your whole life has been to get to this point. When the gun goes, there's no you know training exercise. This this yeah. is this is it. This is the front line. I remember mm -hmm. with Sean. Sean was just you know again you know you know I, you know Sean again the same thing was you know had to be ready and and you were you, you know again I, it was the most you know, the most beautiful sort of um, performance and you know it's flowered. Um, and you know to trust one's own ability just to be because so much times one has to react to act and to, to just to be to to present oneself um i think shoma you would be extraordinarily beautiful extraordinarily beautiful well thank you and uh, and uh, i just just to add to that i mean you know it does start at the top doesn't it, it uh, this is what i've discovered over the years it starts at the top it starts with um you know people at the top, the director and everybody else, trusting who they cast because they know what they're going to need that cast to do. They know, they know, especially as a writer director. So then you, uh, you have to get the DOP and everybody else that you trust to know that they're going to be ready. Um, and we had to be ready. There was no not being ready. Uh, you want to allow them to be as ready. Well, I think Sean, I think, uh, I think Courtier and, and Alistair would, 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 would agree with this as well. And everyone here would agree with this: is that we have to be ready because we never had the opportunity before to do this. So when, 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 what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Yeah. Well, Don't mess this up. Yeah. Don't mess this up. I mean, I had, yeah. I, I had, um, I had, a, I mean, a little story. I know Lenora Critchlow, and I've known Lenora Critchlow for over a decade. Mm. And the very first thing that Lenora said to me back in the day was, "My dad was a guy called Frank Critchlow. I don't know if you've heard of him." And I said, "No, I'm, who's that?" So she told me the story. I was saying to her, Are you... that happened. She was like, yeah. I said, you have to write that. You have to do that. Someone has to do that. Uh, anyway, so what happens is, is that, you know, over a decade, just over a decade later, I am playing, I have to ring her up and say, Lenora, I'm playing your dad. Um, on the very first day, I get, a, I get a photograph of her and her mom and a thumbs up saying, good luck. Um, you know, the point being that the, even though that puts pressure on you in a way, because <laughs> in the way they're going, <laughs> don't mess this up. I mean, don't, but good luck. There's a part of me that thought, yeah, I, I can't mess this up. This is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to tell a real story for my mum to sit down there for once mm -hmm. and watch something mm -hmm. that she completely understands. Mm -hmm. That she can do exactly what <laughs> culture, Steve just everything. did. That she, yeah. that, that she can do exactly what Steve just did and go, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? It's, it's, it's like, I, I can't tell you how honored I am. I mean, to be a part of something like this. I mean, I really mean that because my whole life, um, as I've said, as I said before, I'm answering the same question. You know, uh, these are the types of roles I want to play. These are the type of, if you like, spirits I want to summon, if, if you like. I, I know that sounds weird, but the long and the short of it is, is because I want to do that because it's real. Yeah. It represents yeah, like my is, family. Yeah, this is like this one was this one was was way deeper than cinema. This is that this was ancestral. You know what I mean? Like this yes. was this was yeah. this was just like this was like on another this was like something else. You know what I mean? And um I know like everybody involved is what that feeling is and you may not be able to articulate it into words, but it no. was there the whole time. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. It was there the whole time. I'm worried about questions. Yeah. I'm so sorry. We're having too much of a bloody good time, mate. No, that's great. <laughs> keep, keep going. Sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, actually, okay. actually to, to Sean, Sean's point about casting, there are a few questions about that, um, specifically about casting John Boyega in Red, White, and Blue, um, a couple of other questions as well about that. But you, Steve, you've, you've talked about just, not just untold stories, but, you know, lost generations, um, generations yeah. of Black yeah. British 
actors and filmmakers and um, cinematographers and producers who did not have the opportunity. And, and I think among other things, the small X films are just this incredible showcases of just the depth of um, acting talent, um, black British acting talent. I mean, each film is populated with like so many sure. amazing actors. So can you talk a little bit about putting these, these casts together? Well, I, I remember meeting Letitia years ago, before Black Panther, I remember I think I had a, did I have a meeting with you before? I was, to, I was told about you before by Gary. Yeah, Gary you did, Davies. yeah, you told, yeah. Yikes, so it was like, you know, people have come, people have gone because it's taken such a long time to sort of get it on screen. Um, and it's, it's, you know, look at the wealth, look at the, look at the depth, look at the wealth. It's like, all you gotta do, it's like, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a gold mine. It's a gold mine. And it's just the fact that people, you know, aren't given opportunities, aren't given a, a chances. And I think, you know, again, as well as work, white working class actors, you know, some amazing, you know, who are just, you know, on building sites. The gentleman who, whose name I forgot, who's, who is, who's a, the, the racist uh, a policeman in Red, Brown, Blue. Amazing actor. What's he doing? He's back on the building site. You know, I think the race and class is a big thing. It's a big thing. Um, and it limits us in how we look at ourselves. I mean, you know, this is, this is Great Britain, apparently. But who are we? What do we look like? I mean, you know, I imagine a lot of American sort of, um, um, you know, audiences looking at us think, my goodness, did that ever happen? Yes, it did, you know. <laughs> And also, there's, there's, you know, it, it happened all over the country, not just in London, in Liverpool, in Bristol, Manchester, elsewhere in the UK, you know. So it's one of those things which is sort of, um, it's, it's, well, you know, it's just we need more stories because these stories are amazing. And, you know, the talent is there. So there you, there, there you go. Um, and I think with John, John Berga, you know, John is an amazing actor. For me, he's like Jack Nicholson. I mean, you know, you get all those movies in the 70s. You know, he has that, but what I mean by that is that the situation with who he is and where he is now and what he can portray is very much about today and the forefront. And Red, White and Blue is at the precipice. This is where we're at right now. This, this, this movie took place in 83, 84, but this is where we are. This is how we've come today. I was talking to Corti about this today. And I don't know if we expand on this in the sense of a way of where we are today. This is where we're at. This isn't a, a, a story. I mean, like, like Courtney, I remember you saying to me today, you saying to me about, um, we, we were talking, you said to me, yeah, you know, the, you know, the, the mangroves and the lovers rock were uh, a rarity and a breather in life. To go to that blues on a Saturday was mm -hmm. to, to, to face up to all the racist rubbish bullshit that was happening the rest of the week, even your job and your life. And that Saturday was a release. So these were rare things in Certainly. life yeah. of triumph. Um, yeah. And Red, White and Blue, I don't know what I'm handing off to you, Court, yet. But what we discussed about it was very yeah, interesting. Yeah, it was very, very interesting. Yeah, no, it was just the, 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 that, that's the majority experience, you know, the, the experience mm -hmm. of, you know, mangrove where, where you get to fight against the system and actually win is actually a rarity, you know, like, like the majority <laughs> of the time people trying to fight against the system and it not changing, it not shifting and moving. But for me, the, the inspirational thing about Leroy is that he didn't let that destroy him. You know, he came out of it on the other side, a strong man and resilient in what he had to do. And he came back to his community, he came back to his culture. So for me, those are the untold heroes, you know, those guys who keep on and carry on and soldier on, Shabir said it, our ancestors, ancestors, you know, drawing the power of our mm. ancestors to be able to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to get through this, man. You know, they had to go through so much, you know, You're going back to you know, 12 years and everything. I think about that on a daily, you know, like my ancestors had to endure that, but they survived and they survived so that I can be here. You know, I think that's really powerful, you know, and I sometimes need to be able to draw from that strength. And someone like Leroy, he did that. So I think some people see that, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, a failure in a sense, but I've never seen that film as a failure. I've never seen his story as a failure in the sense that he took on the well, system I'm, and the system didn't change. Well, I, don't you know, he, like, I feel like he came... I don't necessarily think it's... Because, because it's usually, in, sense, in, a, what, because usually yeah. in, a, in a Hollywood tradition, you know, he would take on the system and the system would change, you know, like in a kind of like in the tradition of stories, you know, the, the hero is supposed to come and, and, and take on you know, the, an organization or whatever, the world and stuff, and, and come out of it on the other side and something's meant to have shifted. I feel like the shift is in him. 
and 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 that resilience is what I see every day like around us you know that like that people uh manage to deal with what's going on around them and stuff and still hold on to some kind of semblance of themselves you know like they, they come out of it unscathed you know on the other side I think that's a beautiful but thing the last to me. the, the last scene in the picture is where we're at right now that's why I meant the last scene in the picture yeah. this is not about yeah, yeah. failure of him sort of having to leave the well basically the Metropolitan Police basically prosecuting for 80 pounds unpaid hotel yeah. fees which they spent a hundred thousand pounds yeah. on trying to persecute uh, prosecute him persecute him as well for over yeah. a year and basically he was found yeah. not guilty then he left. Yeah. Imagine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, yeah. he was persecuted. Then you get to a point where he's put mm -hmm. himself into a system. He's done his best. He's tried to, in, 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 well, not even integrate, try to change within the system. He's put himself in the system. Right. And this is not just him as a yeah, policeman. Yeah. This is him on, as in everybody in a, in a job somewhere mm -hmm. in the United States or United Kingdom as a black person. And what you do in a you know, racist environment, because a lot of those institutions, all those places of work, are not welcoming, no matter if they say they are or not. This is where we're at right now, as far as someone like Leroy, uh, Leroy is concerned. You know, when, what next? What? And this is in 1984. So the, 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 this is this is the last piece of small acts. You know, and the last piece of small acts is okay. How far have we come? Where are we now? And where do we want to go? He's come to the. He, he's gone. He's, you know, he's done his due diligence to want to sort of become a part of the establishment. And the establishment, in effect, are saying, yes, but no. You know, and his father had to go through a certain thing as well. So his father is at a certain point where he's pushed it to a certain level and Leroy wants to push it further. But he's seen that they've come to the same unfortunate situation. So what next? This is where we're at right now in 2020 this is what we're at right now you know and this we this we wrote this we made this before all um, this of the unfortunate situation with george floyd happened you know what's changed and if people don't want to recognize that as a, as, a, as a part of a narrative which is happening now i only want sort of uh, happy endings well this is where this is my life this is my life this is my life i live it every day i live it every goddamn day I'm a Leroy Logan. There's so many of us out there, and we're doing our best. Mm -hmm. We're doing our best. And apparently, often, our best is not oh, good, good enough. enough. And that's what's amazing about the story to me. That's what like, really like, drew me to the story. And, and, and that's what I look to like, all the time, that sense of resilience. It, it makes me want to carry on as well and, and you know, like, take on whatever has been. You have no choice. We, we have no choice, Courtier. Yeah, exactly. Courtier, we exactly. have no yeah, yeah. choice. Like yeah, you yeah. said, the wheel is mm -hmm. turning. And you know, interestingly enough, what happened with um, that story with the father, when he said the father was, was telling the story about the grave digger, that was a true story, because that was, that was the, the, the actor, was it um, Toussaint? Was, Steve, was it Steve Toussaint? Steve. Yeah. yeah. That was what his mother said to him, to be an actor. You know, that's what his, his mother said to him. So we put, I put that in the script. So it's one of those yeah. things where, you know, I, you know, God, you know, you, you know, if you, you can never right now as a black person escape that right now. And I, you know, don't matter how high you go up the tree, there's always your voice for your leg being yanked. And, you know, you know, my father lived and died in a way just like Leroy Logan's father did, lived and died. So many fathers, so many people at the Mangrove lived and died. No, none of the men of the Mangrove are alive. They lived and they died in a situation where they were not seen as heroes, okay? Now we can make them heroes, but they were not seen as heroes. People want to champion now after 50 years when they're dead, but they never was you know what? alive. Anyway. You know time. what the funny, thing, the funny thing is about Mangrove is that I grew up in West London and I had an older man come up to me and say to me, let me tell you the story of Frank Critchlow. I was in my 20s, but he said, let me tell you the story of Frank Critchlow. And he laid it all out for me. And in the community, they were heroes. In the community, they were mythical. People would say to me, look, you see that man there? That's Frank Critchlow. Different people and stuff, you know, they put him out to me and stuff. And so for us, even though the mainstream or the wider society 
weren't telling these stories, we were telling the stories amongst ourselves, you know? Um, I think that's really immensely important that, that we tell our own stories like we are now. Yes, but they, yes, you're absolutely right. But to put, the, to put them in the, in the right position, is for me vitally important. Absolutely, I think you, I, I hear everything you're saying, of course. Here, I just I just want to raise them higher and above my head. You know, higher and above my head. Yeah, for sure. End of story. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. Just, I, I, it's just one of those things. It's going to work. Tough, mm -hmm. But just because I live it every day, we live it every day. We live every day. But and people say, "Oh, sure. really? Is that how it really? Are you sure? Are you sure? Really? Are, are, are you? Are we not mistaken?" Moving on. I think we're actually out of time, <laughs> but we have been getting um, a lot of messages saying thank you uh, for for thank thank you for saying that thank you for all of that and thank you for the films. Um, maybe I'll just leave it by asking if um, any of you want to bring up anything else. I mean, it's just been um, incredible listening to to all of you talk about this. Oh no! I, I, again, I just I just feel honoured to be a part of it, uh, to be a part of uh, this anthology. Um, uh, it just shows that, uh, as well, uh, being uh, speaking selfishly, that this country can do it. Um, so um, we've proven that. Um, it goes to show that, uh, we, as we've already talked about, that there is some fantastic uh, talent. Um, all the way from left to right, costume, makeup, director, writer. Um, there's, there's a lot of people in this country who can tell a great story, uh, a heartfelt story. And um, I don't know, some, it just gives me hope again, for some reason, it, it really does. So um, just honored to be a part of it. Thank you, Steve, again. Yeah, thank you, Steve, seriously. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. Yeah, so I've got a bit passionate there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and like, it's all about passion. It's just one of those things where you know, you know, it's it's just the, the sort of the the situation of film and this community with Alistair, with Sean, with Shabbe, Leticia, with Courtier, you know, Tracy Scofield, David Tenner, and all the, all everyone involved in this, you know. Um, you know, the BBC, you know, Amazon, the possibilities that, that we were given. Um, and uh, I just want to say thank you, really. And also, so lastly, but, but not, 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 not least, thank you, Dennis and Eugene, because, you know, guess what? We had an opportunity to put these things on the big screen where they are supposed to be. And without you guys, um, you know, we wouldn't have had a, a, a premiere in, in, in the way that, 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 that we did. So yeah, thank you for, for that, and thank, thank you, you all thank you so much for, for your your love and support of of, of small likes and uh, yeah, Black Lives Matter. Well, I, too. I I wish all of you could have been here for us. Um, showing these films uh, on the big screen to New York has been just hugely meaningful. Um, for and can we get more black critics, please? I'm sorry. Oh my goodness, we need more black critics. I'm sorry. I mean, goodness yeah. gracious, what yeah. scientist? What scientist comes up with uh, some kind of uh, concoction, conclusion without other aspects of possibility? I mean, come on. We need more critics of color. We do because people don't. People talk talking are talking, and it's like, oh, this person has no idea. It's very interesting. We have to have a bigger spectrum of criticism. This is not to say that black people can't critique white. White, white situations or uh, or vice versa but we have to have a much more of a look look at this screen this screen is beautiful look at this screen it's bloody beautiful why can't we have this why go figure that's true it's a very interesting point you know, never you, even thought about that before never you look at an apple it, and like, i look at yeah. an apple we see two different things come on come on now different points of view that's the no, whole point yeah, about a point of view we're looking can... at the same thing but Absolutely. it's a different point Absolutely. You know, so yes. I, yeah. I mean, there's so many Leroy Logans in the film industry. It's crazy, you know. Yikes! I, you know, like, you know, whatever. It's just one of those things that need to be they need to change. People talk about this, and right now where we're sitting, it smells like it smells bad. So, don't smell good. 
I think you should you, you should keep going, Steve. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to no, talk baby. about? No, baby. You want a headline. You want a headline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Protect your space, Steve. Mm. I want your game. Finish his game. Guys, thank you so much. Can we yeah, community yeah. now? This, yeah. I, I do think we are out of time, but uh, thank you to each and every one of you. Um, this has been very special. We've, we've really, it's, it's meant a lot to show these films um, and this has been an amazing conversation. So thank you all for joining us um, today and you can still see them. Uh, I think they're, they're available for another day. So all three of the Small X films, um, you can catch them uh, at uh, filmlink.org. So thanks again. Bye guys. Bye, Bye guys. Love you all. See you soon. Good night.